Thank you, Julie. Hi, everybody. Hi, I'm Colin. I'm the pastor here at Northern Light, and uh, this is a good morning. It feels good. I feel good to be here. This is one of my favorite places in the whole world. Did you know that? And, uh, and it's not because of the beautiful art of the delicious coffee. It's because of the warmth of your presence, uh, the ways that I've experienced this community, encouraging each other, supporting each other through hard times, and, uh, and showing love through all circumstances. You know, we, we, don't, we don't do too many things perfectly around here, um, but we're trying to be perfected in love. And uh, that's, that's uh, something I love about Northern Light, and I hope that you've experienced that. Um, and if you haven't, just stick around, because I think you probably will. Um, hey, I want to say something quick. Uh, if you were here with us last Sunday, uh, raise your hand if you were here last Sunday and helped us sort cocoa beans. That was awesome. Um, so uh, any month with five Sundays here at Northern Light, we uh, do a service project with our Sunday morning instead of a church service. And this past week, we sorted cocoa beans for an organization called Enliven. And what they do is they uh, buy cocoa beans from farmers in Nicaragua. They pay them closer to market value. Uh, they pay them well over market value for their beans. Um, and then they do the work of sorting and washing the beans. And then when they sell them to uh, chocolate manufacturers, the proceeds then go back into the community that the cocoa beans came from. It's pretty awesome. Um, and so last week, we sorted over 600 pounds of cocoa beans. And that, res that results in over 25, almost $2,500 in, uh, in benefit for the community that the cocoa beans come from. So thank you so much for being a part of that. Yeah, that was awesome. We are definitely going to coordinate with them again in the future because that was just fantastic. Um, so thanks for being a part of that, and thank you for being here today. And with that, I'd like to invite Amy to come forward and read this morning's scripture. Today's scripture comes from Revelation 1, verses 1 through 6. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place, he made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. To the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings on the, of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Thanks, Amy. All right, here we are, um, as promised. Um, Today, we're starting a new series that'll last the whole month of October, where I'm going to be talking about the book of Revelation for this whole month. Um, if you didn't know that coming in, I'm sorry, um, <laughs> but um, don't worry, or fear not, all right, because uh, we're leaning into the book of Revelation to open up the ways that it is not as intimidating as you thought it was. It's not as scary or foreboding or ominous or any of those things. It's a book full of life and hope for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. Um, that's why we're calling the series Revelation. It isn't the end of the world. So, um, and, uh, so next week, I'm going to be talking about the idea of tribulation in the book of Revelation, which is, you know, that's one of the big best-selling novel stories about where this book is going. And I'm going to give a different, more hope-filled, inspiring version of that image uh, in the book of Revelation. And today, we're going to just take a step back and do a view from 10,000 feet on what exactly gets revealed in Revelation. So, that's where we're starting. The word revelation comes from the Greek uh, word apocalypsis, which if it sounds familiar, uh, it's where we get the word apocalypse. But that doesn't mean the end of the world, it doesn't mean a great big battle, it just means um, unveiling or revealing. Something was hidden, and now we can see it. Um, and that's actually the Greek name for this book. As you just heard the first few words, this is a revelation of Jesus Christ to John. 
So that's where we're starting with. And the question is, what does Revelation reveal? What is unveiled within these few pages that has captured the imagination of not only Christians, but authors and artists and filmmakers for so long? You don't have to Google very far to find out that lots and lots of Bible teachers have a very clear opinion of what uh, the Re book of Revelation unveils. Many people believe the book of Revelation is some kind of coded message about the future, that if you're smart enough or spiritual enough or holy enough, you'll be able to get the secret decoder ring from God that'll reveal the hidden messages in this book. Uh, a man named John Napier looked through all the images and numbers in the book of Revelation, and he calculated the exact date of the end of the world. Wow, that's a smart guy, right? Yeah, based on his findings, uh, according to Napier, the world will end, just get ready, the world will end in 1688. Whoops. Uh, yeah, missed it by that much, right? Um, I'm so glad the world didn't end before the invention of Netflix, aren't you? That uh, would have been rough. People would have really missed out. Uh, one of the more famous recent predictions was made for midnight on May 21st, 2011. Do you remember that one? Uh, Reverend Harold Camping launched a major media campaign that received a lot of attention in mainstream press uh, and also resulted in millions of dollars of donations, so that worked out great for him. Um, coincidentally, I actually led a youth group lock-in that night. Um, uh, guess what? Nobody got raptured. Um, I mean, unless, unless you count like the, I don't, the water balloon fight. That's, that, um, it's a good thing, too, because I didn't have any stipulation for rapture in the consent form, so that would have really been, that would have been messy. But, you know, it's closer to home, too. Even John Wesley, uh, the well-regarded founder of the Methodist movement, of which we are a part, uh, he, he read Revelation 12, 14 and predicted that the thousand-year reign of Jesus would come by the year 1836. Yep, not quite. So, there are hundreds of other examples of this. Um, people looking at this little book at the end of our Bibles and launching off on wild predictions about the future, trying to figure out the mystery of the universe and where it's all going, unveiled by the book of Revelation. And I think it's because people have a fundamentally skewed notion of what this book is and what it's trying to accomplish. You see, the book of Revelation wasn't originally some kind of Nostradamus list of predictions for the future, even though that's what many of us assume as we open the pages of it. Even though um, it was originally a letter written to seven churches in Asia Minor, which is present-day Turkey. And if we're going to get anything out of this book, this is actually a rule for the whole Bible, all right, as you come to it. If we're going to get anything out of this book especially, we're going to have to figure out what it meant to those first recipients nearly 2,000 years ago in ancient Turkey. We need to read it on its own terms. Otherwise, our attempts to unveil the meaning of Revelation will only leave the truth feeling more shrouded and secret than ever instead of revealed, like the name of the book says it's supposed to do. And I know that a lot of you might have heard a lot of different ideas about how to read Revelation and what it says, uh, where this whole world is headed. And some of you might feel like you know nothing at all about the book of Revelation, and you're okay with that, <laughs> because this, it's this big scary mystery, and so you don't even look into it. Well, however much or little you've looked into the book of Revelation, I hope that we can open it up with fresh eyes uh, throughout the course of this series this month, and to see the gift of hope and the challenge to faithfulness that it's offering to us. So that's where we're headed. Uh, I got a little analogy that I think will help us moving forward. Uh, how many of you have seen the movie The Wizard of Oz? I better see all hands, okay? If, <laughs> this, is, like, this is not optional as Americans, right? Um, okay, now how many of you have read the book? All right, okay, a little, a little fewer, fewer. That's okay, it's okay. Um, now, if you read the book Wizard of Oz in school, you probably heard that there is a lot more going on behind the images and characters in this seemingly simple fantasy story than you first realized. Have you heard about this? 
many literary theorists suggest the book is actually a commentary on late 19th century U.S. monetary policy. I'm not even kidding about that. Um, with the yellow brick road, yellow bricks, that's representing the gold standard, right? And the silver slippers, they're silver in the book. They made them red for the movie because it looked better in color. Um, the silver slippers represented the silver right 16 to 1 ratio. Of course, I mean, how could you miss that, right? <laughs> and the Emerald City representing the green of our currency. And the author, L. Frank Baum, confirmed many of these ideas with the ways that he adapted The Wizard of Oz for the stage in 1901. Now, for most of us, that sounds like a pretty weird hypothesis, right? That's like, I thought it was just about somewhere over the rainbow in Munchkin land. Um, why would this author write all write, and hide all of these political ideas in these images, in this story? But for the readers, the first readers of The Wizard of Oz, these ideas weren't hidden at all. That was the big conversation in their world at the time. And so they read even these fantasy stories through that lens. Um, that debate about monetary policy was as heated and all-consuming as the one going on this past week about the Supreme Court in our country. When people read this story, The Wizard of Oz, their connection between this fantasy world and the one that they were living in just jumped right off the page. And it illustrated the author's perspective on the problems of their world in new and colorful ways. People understood the problem in fresh ways and they understood his perspective in clearer ways than if he had just written an essay. And I'd like to suggest that the book of Revelation functions in much the same way, except the conversation that we get a glimpse of through its pages isn't happening in Kansas. Uh, it's happening in the ancient Mediterranean world. And the story isn't from 100 years ago, it's from 2,000 years ago. So it's going to be harder work to get inside the story that's hidden in this story and in these images. It's understandable why we'd read Revelation and finish the book with more questions than we start once you hold that in view. But I have this conviction about the way the book of Revelation has survived all these years. Revelation had to make sense to the first people who read it, right? And not just in some kind of nonchalant, oh, cool story, bro, kind of way. Like it had to make sense uh, it, must, it had to have gripped them as hard as something that was immediately, undeniably true. That's why they hung on to it, and that's why it wound up in our Bibles, right? Like, if they read it and it didn't connect with their lives, they would have put it on the bottom of the stack, like uh, an old National Geographic. You know, put yourself in the first place of the first readers of this book. You're figuring out what it means to follow Jesus in a world that is backwards and broken in a million different ways. The first century Christians uh, were not the people in power. And the people who were in power, they didn't care about these low-life Christians at all. The leaders of all the big religious institutions, they were trying to get rid of them because they were a nuisance. And there were lots of competing ideas even among Christians about what following Jesus really meant in the first century. And then someone hands you a nonsensical story about scrolls and trumpets and bowls, oh my, um, and says, I know this doesn't make sense now, but 2,000 years, it's going to be really important that people have this story. So make sure you hang on to this. Are you going to hang on to that? No. You've got bigger fish to fry, right? Your life is complicated, and you need help living through that complicated life you're living through. So this story had to have helped them in their complicated living situation. Does that make sense? All right. So if the book of Revelation was only about some future events that were going to happen some date in the far distant future, there's no way it would have been beloved by its first audience. So beloved that they preserved it for us today. So Revelation starts with these letters of encouragement to these churches. Encouragement and warning written to seven ancient churches in seven cities in ancient Turkey. And after that, the setting moves to heaven, all right, where there are a series of judgments poured out on the earth. And the judgments are followed by a massive cosmic battle with dragons and beasts and stuff, all right? That's where most of us kind of 
start to glaze over a little bit. Because it sounds like chaos, right? It doesn't hold together in the way we understand stories work. It sounds like senseless violence. It sounds like a, a cosmos full of confusion and blood and anger and frustration. It sounds a lot like the life of a follower of Jesus in first century Rome, actually. The swirling of politics and chariots, swords and senates, and their claim as followers of Jesus that all of that is just sound and fury. That the real power of the world is in the hands of a wandering rabbi, a wandering rabbi among a conquered people who is executed as an enemy of the state. And this Jesus guy tells us the way to battle the powers that be is by turning the other cheek, by offering forgiveness, by loving your neighbor, by loving your enemy, by listening to the poor and having dinner with them, by giving outcasts a place to belong. And that sounds foolish. It sounds impossible. What kind of world do these Christians think they live in? How can you possibly make sense of their way of life when you look around this crazy, violent world? And that's why we have the book of Revelation. Revelation rewrites the story of power and shows how behind the veil of the events of this world, there is a revelation of God's unending love that overcomes evil. All right, so that, that's, that's my big claim about the book of Revelation. That's why it's on the screen. I'm going to read it again. Revelation rewrites the story of power, and it shows how behind the veil of the events of this world, there is a revelation of God's unending love that overcomes evil. And here's how you can tell. I'll just give you one little bit of evidence here. Um, in chapter 5 of Revelation, there's this little scene before things start to get really crazy. And in it, the author of the book, John, is describing a vision that he saw that God gave to him. And he says that there's this scroll with seven seals and no one is worthy to open it. He really wants to see what's inside the scroll, but no one can open it. And then he hears a voice from heaven that says, see, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. And so John Here's the voice, and he turns to see this lion. And he describes the scene like this. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had, it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne. Encircled by the four living creatures and the elders, the lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And that fantastic image that... John says he sees is a spiritualized description of Jesus, both the lion and the lamb, right? And that's how the story starts, with this visionary glimpse of Jesus who has been sacrificed like a lamb at the slaughter. So that's how it begins, right? This is after the letters, before we launch into all of the everything. And then on the other side of the story, Here's how it ends. We find this scene. It says, the, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Do you hear that? Down the middle of the great street of the city, each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. There will not, they will not need the, lamp, the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. Did you, did you notice anything here? Through all the judgments, all the battles, all the death and the plague and the tribulation that happens in this book, on the other side of everything, at the end of all things, there he is again, this lamb. He was slain in the beginning, 
but now he's enthroned, welcoming all of creation into this beautiful, joyful, restored world. Jesus, the Lamb of God, is the thread through this whole story. And this, this bookend, is John's way of telling the struggling churches of the first century, when you are a victim of violence, Christ is right there. When you are persecuted for doing good, Christ is right there. When you lose what you love, Christ is right there. When you meet great hate with greater love, Christ is right there. The strong arm of the empire might seem like an invincible enemy, but when the dust settles on history, it is the power of love and sacrifice that will remain, standing as tall and proud as God on his throne. But, I mean, what could this old story possibly have to do with us, right? I was thinking about how that works to this week. Uh, our world is so different from ancient Rome. But, of course, over the last few weeks, I already mentioned I've been listening breathlessly, just like many of you, as powerful politicians rage and rant in the halls of power as they debate about whether or not this one particular man deserves to sit on the Supreme Court. Maybe you've noticed that story. Um, and the wheels of war have rolled through our media, just like they roll through the pages of Revelation. There's accusations of perjury and assault and conspiracy and slander. And we should care about things like this. We, should really, we really should care. We should care about truth and justice. We should care about standing up for victims and for justice. We should care about the character of our leaders. But Revelation teaches us that no matter what happens, there is still a lamb on the throne. The road of history leads through violence and pain and abuse, but it leads to a river of life, inevitably, to the throne room of God where love and sacrifice are the banners of his royal victory over the world. Not scratching and clawing for power, but opening up your life as a gift to the world. And as followers of Jesus, God's promise to us is the same as it was 2,000 years ago. I'll say it again. When you are a victim of violence, Christ is right there. When you're persecuted for doing good, Christ is right there. When you lose what you love, Christ is right there. When you meet great hate with greater love, Christ is right there. And that's what Revelation reveals. It reveals that behind the pain of this world and the pain of your life, through the drum beats of war and chaos and confusion and people clawing for power and knocking each other in half with swords and blood rising up to the, to the saddles of horses. In the midst of all that, in this world or that one, Jesus, the Lamb of God, is on the throne. And don't miss this. He isn't on the throne in spite of his suffering. He isn't on the throne in spite of his sacrifice. He isn't on the throne in spite of the fact he loved his enemies. Jesus, the Lamb of God, is exalted in the heavens and in this world because of those things. That's the shape of this world and the direction it's all going. And in the face of all appearances to the contrary, when we live lives of hope and sacrifice, we are on the side that can lose everything in this world and still win in the end. Pray with me. God, we turn to you with our hearts wide open. And this book that has been confusing and confounding for so long 
seems now to, to appear to be an invitation to a life of love and hope. And we ask that you would stir within us so that we can respond just as those people did all those years ago when they first read this book. To respond to this story that shows you are with us no matter what with great faithfulness and great love for you and for this, for this world you created. Amen.